Mark chapter 2. All right, has anyone ever worked like one of those jobs where like no one likes you? All right, like where you're just like, um, okay, we're reading about tax collectors. If you work for IRS, like it's not the same thing today, all right? But today, later today, in case you didn't know, today's the Super Bowl. And I know that, you know, I've been, since I've been in Oregon, I realized there's like one kind of football fan and it's a college football fan. And so for those of you who don't like pro football, Super Bowl is the pro football, like, national championship type game, okay? Um, I'm just kidding. You guys are like, we know. We've been around longer than you, okay? Um, But you're like, there's a duck. Is there a duck in the game today? Because I hear it's like, okay, is there a duck playing? There are a couple ducks playing in the game today? All right. So you guys already know. You're up to date on that. I heard it's the, um, what is it, the San Diego Ducks? Is that what someone said it was? Because the quarterback, Justin Herbert? Anyway. There is a job that is played uh, today, all right? There is a job that is, um, that is going to be done today that, that a lot of people are just going to hate, all right? And especially in the Super Bowl. It's the job of the zebra, okay, or the referee, all right? I used to ref basketball. Like, that was one of my first jobs. I refed basketball games for local parks and rec department. And I'll tell you what, little Johnny's mommy and daddy thought he was going to be the next Sacramento king, all right, which... I know you're going to laugh because who are the kings, right? But when you, when you grow up near Sacramento, that's your team and that, that's who you love. And they thought little Johnny was going to be. And so if I called traveling on little Johnny, even though he held the ball and was like this, you know, like I was the worst person in the world, right? And today there's going to be a lot of people who are going to start cussing at the refs for blowing a call or they're going to be so upset. They're going to blame the whole, the whole game or the outcome of the game on the ref. Anyone ever done that watching any kind of sports game? All right, some got people shooting their hands up, other people kind of ducking their heads like, all right, it's always the ref's fault. I'm like, well, if the guy would have just caught the ball three times when he dropped it all three times, maybe the ref wouldn't have made that call. But anyway, we find ourselves in one of those uh, type of scenarios, okay? Uh, Today we're going to talk about, in fact, one of my favorite stories of all time, Jesus will call a sinner, a tax collector to follow him. And and this is kind of that that scene, if you will. This is like one of those jobs or professions that nobody chose, all right? Nobody grew up going, man, I really want to be a tax collector, all right? Especially in Jerusalem, especially someone who's part um, of the the nation of Israel, they did not want to be a tax collector. In fact, tax collectors, we're going to learn in a little bit, were lumped in with like thieves and murderers. Like this is like a horrible place and position to be. And I love how it's Jesus is the one who calls that person, all right? But now I'm getting ahead of myself. All right, but imagine just a job that no one would want, a job that maybe um, you were doing, but now this, this foreign government comes in and tells them like you're supposed to be able to travel on different routes with with freedom you don't have to pay anything but now another governor another uh, government comes in and imposes a tax on a certain people and this is the person who has to come up and say hey give me all your money all right maybe like a parking attendant or like you know a traffic cop who's writing tickets you're like I was only there for five minutes and when you really were there for 36 and you can only be there for 30 and they're just I'm writing the ticket here you go stamping it on the window some of you have like 30 years worth of unpaid tickets right I get it I understand similar to something like that all right but the point of the passage is pretty clear Jesus is going to call sinners to come alive in God's kingdom so if you have your Bibles open with me in Mark chapter 2 welcome to chapter 2 well we started last week so we're only going to go through five verses today it's going to be a fun day and then we'll get you home to either not watch football watch football or plan for Valentine's Day which is also tomorrow just in case you didn't know that all right Mark chapter 2, verse 13. He went out. Who is he? Jesus. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching. I'm going to stop right there. You know me. I like to go really slow through the Bible, and you're like, gosh, okay, this is what he just does. So follow along. He was teaching, all right? How many times, how many stories have we come along in Mark where he begins with teaching? Almost every single one, right? Almost, almost since his baptism, as he went into the towns, he started to teach with authority, and that caused the, the unclean spirits to get ticked off and run at him. What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth, right? I changed my voice, and you were like, why is he doing that? Because the Hollywood movies do that, okay? He goes into another town. He's, he's at, inside of a home, maybe his home teaching, and all of a sudden, four guys break through his roof and drop a paralyzed man in front of him, right? He's always leading with teaching. In fact, after a day of teaching, he goes home and heals 
heals all the sick, all the demon possessed who are brought to the house. And then he says, I got to get away. He goes and prays. And and when the disciples find him, he says, I got to go preach about the kingdom of God. I have to go to another town and teach about the kingdom of God. That is why I have come. Jesus is concerned about teaching of the kingdom of God. And the majority of these stories start out the same. He's in a place. He's alongside a lake teaching about the kingdom of God. He is uh, keeping his priority of his mission to be the message about the kingdom of God. But he's not just like a talking head or like a philosophical guru, right? People don't make pilgrimages to go lay at the feet of Jesus and say, I have one question and like, kind of like a genie, like I, I have the one quest. This is the question I have for you. He's not that. In fact, he's an itinerant preacher, which means he's living out his message, by or living out his mission by taking his message to the world. He is an incarnational God. He's a God who takes on human flesh and walks and brings his message and spreads it from town to town. He's not like, come see me and I will give you the answer to life. He goes, I'm coming to you because you need to know that there is a new way to live in this world and I'm calling and inviting you to come be a part of it. And the presence of the crowd suggests that his message is actually for the masses. It's not just for those who will travel to see a guru or to go answer or ask a question to the man who has all the wisdom. This is a message that needs to get out to as many people as possible, especially those who stand on the fringes of religious respectability or even those outside of it. Look at the people who have heard his teaching so far. Look at the people who've responded to the message that God's kingdom is at hand. And while he's at the lake, Jesus calls Levi. He's walking along the the side of the lake and Jesus calls Levi to follow him. He's also known as Matthew in in the book of Matthew, chapter 9, verse 9. But here it is in verse 14. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he, Levi, rose and followed him. It's common for people in in this time to have multiple names, or at least to be known by different names. Um, In fact, one of the most famous characters in the Bible, his name is Saul, and he's wreaking havoc on the followers of Jesus. And and yet when he goes into the Greek or the Greco-Roman world and gets away from Jerusalem, it says he's also known as Paul, right? God didn't change his name. He actually just had two different names. He's known like that. That's the idea here is that Levi is most likely Matthew. There isn't some like key, like document we found in history to say, well, it's actually Levi and Matthew, someone else. It is probably the same person, most likely that Matthew and Levi is the same exact person. And here he worked for Herod Antipas, right? King Herod. And he's really the middleman in a complex taxing system. All right, he's not the IRS, all right? For all anything you want to say about the IRS, he's not the IRS. He is a middleman working in a complex tax system and his tax collector booth probably acted like a toll booth. You know when you go on a bridge and you go across, you got to pay the toll before you cross. Th- this area, this region of the world was it was a commonly used trade route. All right. And so it was a booth alongside. Now I said earlier, like this is a path that they used to be able to travel for free. And now like because Rome came in and and dominated that world, they set up a tax booth. Anytime you want to go on this trade route, you have to pay up to Caesar. And so Levi's the middleman between the Roman government and Herod, because Herod's acting like basically Rome's plaything is a fake god or a vassal king in the or not a god, a vassal king. He's like a fake king in the area just because Rome said he could be and so just, just keep the area kind of free of chaos. And so Levi takes money from his people, from the Jews, from those in Jerusalem, from from those who live in the nation of Israel. He extorts their money above and beyond what was required. Okay, so Herod's going to get his money, right? Just like the IRS. I keep saying the IRS. If you work for the IRS, I love you. You're welcome. You're free. Come on. Sinners are welcome, all right? Um, (laughs) That's, that's biblical right here in the text, all right? Oh, forgive me. All right. Herod was going to get his money because if Herod didn't get his money, Rome didn't get their money, and Herod would probably lose his head. Do you understand what we're going with here? Now, in order for Levi to make a living and to survive, he's going to get his money too. So if Herod needed 50 taxable units, 
Levi might tell you, you owe me 60 taxable units so I can have 10 for myself and I will give 50 back to Herod. And he does that to every single person. And they know that. They know this man is supposed to be in their nation, part of their people, part of the people of God, but yet he is extorting money from the people of God to give to the Roman Empire. And they don't like him. He's taking from his own people to make a living. In fact, I, I guess we're, we're unsure if he chose this job. It might have been the only one he could find. But tax collectors were hated, despised, known or thought of as unclean. In fact, old Jewish tradition lumped them together with thieves and murderers. They were disqualified to give witness in a court. And they were a cause of disgrace to his family. The fact that it says he's a son of Alphaeus, this might be the Alphaeus who has, who has kind of excommunicated him from his family. You're not my boy anymore. You're robbing from God's people. I mean, imagine that. This is where he is. This is his position. And yet Jesus calls him to follow him. And immediately he gets up and goes. But following Jesus is a high cost for Levi. Because he's not just walking away from any old profession. His profession is immediately tied or directly tied to King Herod, which is tied to the Roman Empire. So if all of a sudden Herod goes to collect all the taxes that's supposed to come in and he realizes I'm short, this is a huge risk. This is a huge cost of Levi to follow Jesus. But it isn't any different from us as we decide or choose to follow Jesus, as we respond to his call in our life. It is a huge cost to us. It is a huge risk in our own world today. It's also, though, a change of allegiance. Like I said, he is working for King Herod Antipas, right? So all of his allegiance goes to this proclaimed king of the Jews. In fact, when Herod hears of Jesus' birth, he gets ticked off, gets annoyed, and tries to send an edict to kill all the babies because they heard that the Messiah, the king, was actually born in Bethlehem. And Herod gets all worried and worked up and goes on a, a tyrannical uh, rampage to kill all the babies. And yet Levi is putting his allegiance to him every time he extorts money from his people. But now there's a new would-be, long-awaited for king of Israel is calling him to change allegiance from Herod and from the emperor and to turn and to follow him, to come alive in his kingdom. There's a new king calling him away from his past, from his old identity. Come follow me. Be a part of this new kingdom. And there's something about Jesus' message that Levi immediately followed him. I know it's Mark, and Mark writes immediately all the time, and we probably count like 20 already in the book of Mark, two chapters in. But I love how Levi's like, I'm following him. Maybe it's the first time in a long time someone actually spoke to him with respect. Maybe it's the first time in a long time he didn't get treated as a disgraceful scoundrel an outcast in society, maybe for the first time he was looked at through the eyes of a loving king who said, come and follow me. No one here wants you, but I do. And the call that Jesus reaches out to Levi, he responds, all right, I'm going. And I love what happens. Levi throws him a banquet, right? I'm following, I'm leaving this life of tax collecting behind. I'm going after Jesus. I'm gonna throw a banquet. And here we are in verse 15. And as he reclined at the table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? In verse 17, and when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. So Jesus is at the house. He's at Levi's house. He's reclining at the table. And he's, tax collectors and sinners are right there eating with Jesus. Right? Sinners probably refers to the way they were talked about in the Old Testament. All right? So them being very wicked. Those, according to the Old Testament, were actually outside of the law. They stand outside of the law. They're not just breaking the law. They just, they don't even fit in a category. They are categorically wretched scoundrels outside of the law. They are wicked to the definition. And it's those people who Jesus is eating with. 
He is reclining with them, which shows that this is a banquet. This isn't just a quick, you know, little happy meal at a uh, little juice box. I stopped at Chick-fil-A twice in the last few days. Oh, I love Chick-fil-A. They're not eating Chick-fil-A, okay? This is like a banquet. This is a feast. This is them reclining at a table, sharing a moment of honor, of intimacy. And the way that Jesus is portrayed in this passage, it's almost as if he is the host of the banquet, He's bringing them his message. I can just imagine him there with, with the wretched, the outcasts, the, the scoundrels, the people who have been cut off or canceled from society because of their status. And Jesus is reclining with them, talking to them about the kingdom of God. Hey, I got a new way to live in this world. And Matthew says, blessed are the poor in spirit. These are the very poor in spirit. These are the people who are who are canceled in society, moved out to the edges, to the fringes, or aren't even in. They stand outside the law, and Jesus is like, man, I got a kingdom for you. And I love how, like, the one who has the authority to forgive sins, we learned that last week, is now hanging out with with sinners. So he actually can forgive them of all of their sins. He's bringing his message and his very person to those of lowly status. Now, there's a juxtaposition here. So we have the sinners, the outcasts, the low, the wretched, the scoundrels, the disgusting, the hated, the disgraceful. And then enter into the scene, you have the opposite, the elite in the religious society. You have the Pharisees. And the Pharisees see what Jesus is doing. They hear what he's doing, and they don't really have the guts to say it to Jesus. Have you noticed that? They go to the disciples because there's a lot of disciples there. So they go to the disciples. But before we cast light on Pharisees and kind of, um, you know, make our judgment about them, let's know about them for a second. Okay, they're a separatist movement. They're obsessed with holiness and separation from anything that would make them spiritually unclean. So you can imagine now why they even say, why is he eating with them? It would make him unclean. It would make him spiritually defiled. They were strict. They, They practiced strict adherence to the law. So to the written law, the Old Testament, the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, right? They, that's what they adhered to. But they also had oral traditions and other laws. In fact, they were, it's kind of like they were known for building a fence. Like if here was the actual law that they would want you to follow, they, they, would, they would build a fence around it. So that way people won't even get close to breaking the law. Like we'll just build a little barrier. In fact, we'll build another barrier. We'll create all these other laws because we really don't want you to break that law. All right? They were self-righteous because they earned it from mastering the law. Listen to this. This is written in the Mishnah, which is an old uh, a tr- Jewish tradition in some of the writings. It says, He that occupies himself in the study of the law, which is a Pharisee, is deserving of the whole world. Deserving of the whole world. He is called friend, beloved of God, lover of God, lover of mankind, and it clothes him with humility and reverence and fits him to become righteous, saintly, upright, and faithful. And it keeps him far from sin and brings him near to virtue. And from him men enjoy counsel and sound knowledge and understanding and might. So this little eulogy of someone who had passed is, is, testifies that the Torah is the standard of those who are deserving. Those who are deserving of virtue and for elite status. Those who are, are righteous, self-righteous in a way. But we can't just paint them in a total neg- with total negative colors, okay? Like we're, as we're painting this picture of them, they're not totally negative. In fact, they were respected at their time. If anyone's going to be holy, they're going to be pure. Like everyone in society respected the Pharisees because they actually took it serious and they lived it out. They actually, in one account in the book of Luke, they they helped Jesus. All right. And even Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, comes to faith in Christ because he knows the scripture and he realizes there's something about Jesus that is, it's been pointing to him all along and he wants to know what it's like to, to be born again. How does, he, how does he enter into this kingdom of God? And so the, the Pharisees aren't, we can't just look at them because now we look at them and go, oh, they're just hypocrites, right? Jesus didn't have a problem with their love of purity and their drive to be, to be holy and to adhere to the law. He started to judge them because of their hypocritical application of the law. 
All right, and we're going to get that. In fact, if you read commentaries, it says like basically chapter two and three is just Jesus is opposed, like his ministry is opposed because the next few weeks it's the Pharisees are going to start asking him questions and opposing because they're looking at him and going, you're, you're not following the law. You're not doing what it says to do because they were so obsessed with it. Again, the point of contention is not their adherence, but their hypocritical or inconsistent ways that they, that they work toward that goal of purity. So here's the scandal of the story, all right? Here's the scandal of the story. Jesus loves sinners. He's a friend of sinners. He eats with sinners. He extends grace to sinners. He brings to them the good news of the kingdom of God. And the Pharisees, to them, that is a scandal, The sinners, the outcasts, the murderers, the thieves, the despised, the hated, they don't deserve righteousness because they didn't do anything to earn it. And that's the scandal. Jesus is like, I came for the sick. A physician doesn't heal well people. A physician heals sick people. And if you're willing to admit it, this is amazing news. If you're willing to admit that you're sick, this is amazing news. He brings them the good news and they are sick and their need to be made whole. He loves them and calls them to exchange their lives of sin for a life of wholeness in the kingdom of God. That's the scandal. The Pharisees don't understand it. And I love how they don't even ask him. They just ask the disciples, but Jesus overhears them and goes, come on now, I didn't call, I didn't come. Like the sick don't need a, or the healthy don't need a doctor. I came, I came to call the sinners. They're, they're the sick ones. They need it. They need the doctor. And so let's take this passage home. Again, the overarching theme and the overarching point of this whole story is that Jesus calls sinners to follow him. If you're taking notes, you have your little handout inside your bulletin. That's the first fill in the blank. Jesus calls sinners to follow him. Again, chapter 2, verse 14, uh, Mark sets up the story. He's a tax collector. This is Levi. He leaves his booth. If, if you were hearing that for the first time in the first century, you'd be like, oh my gosh, what is Jesus doing? Like he already called fishermen, which was kind of like, oh, they're just, you know, the common folk of the day. But now he goes after like the wretched, the wicked, and he calls sinners. And then at the very end, he just says, I have not come to call the righteous. I've come to call sinners. It's a pretty obvious point in the story, but let's write it down just to keep it. He calls Levi. Society has canceled him because of his social status, because of his job, because of his identity. And yet Jesus, that's the one that Jesus says, I have come to call people just like you to leave your life of sin, to leave your identity, right? Because last week we found out he has the power and the authority on earth to forgive sins. Remember when the paralyzed man was dropped to the feet and they're like, ah, Jesus, there he is. And he goes, your sins are forgiven. And they're like, what? He's paralyzed. He goes, well, what's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or take up your mat and go. He goes, just to show you I can do the harder thing, take up your mat and go. And everyone's like, whoa, we haven't seen anything like this. Remember that story? I get excited about these stories. So the one who has the authority on earth to forgive sins now calls those who need forgiveness. I love how the words spoken earlier today, you can forgive yourselves too because the one who has authority to forgive sins calls people who are full of sin to be forgiven of their sin. He doesn't go to hang out with the party crowd just to say I hang out with the party crowd. He goes to the party crowd because he realizes if I go to the party crowd and I share my message, there are people there who will realize that they're sick and they will need a savior. They will need someone to heal them and make them whole. If he went to the, to the Pharisees, they would be like, no, we're already righteous. Why do you share about a kingdom of God? We're already in. We hold the law. So Jesus goes to the people that once they realize that they are, are sick in a need of a, of a physician, they will be the ones to admit it and give their lives to him. But we have to remember here, as we're on this side of it, as we look at that, that idea of grace, or Jesus calls sinners, we have to remember that grace comes before transformation. Right? Because we're so quick to say, well, they need a transformed life. Like these sinners, they need to leave their, leave their parties. They, need, they can't party anymore. They can't even work for Rome. We, grace has to be extended first before transformation takes place. I mean, that's all throughout the letters and the epistles throughout the New Testament. Paul will talk about, okay, this is where you are in Christ. And this is what God has done for you. Grace, you've been saved by grace through faith. So now change your behavior. Remember, God raised you with Christ and seated you in the heavenly realms. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. And because of all that, now cut off everything that's not of him. Let God offer grace to sinners first. 
and then watch that grace of God transform them into the image of Jesus. That's how it was for me, friends. That's how it is for you. So as more and more sinners, even in our world today, are called by Jesus to follow him, grace is extended and then transformation takes place. As we're taking this passage home, the second thing I was thinking about is the message of the kingdom of God leaves us with two choices. Here's the first one. We can pridefully reject. We can pridefully reject, which would lead to us opposing Jesus. Right? The Pharisees reject his message of the kingdom of God. They fail to see or even fail to admit their need for a doctor. They didn't admit that they were sick, and that's the point. So his good news of the kingdom of God is actually bad news to them. It doesn't, it's not even news to them. Like, well, I'm righteous. I read to you the, the eulogy in the Mishnah of, of someone who, had, who was studying the law. They were, they were deserving of righteousness because they gave themselves to the study of the law. Like they th- the Pharisees thought, well, I earned this. Pat myself on the back. And so their pride got in the way. And they pridefully reject Jesus. And as they do that, over and over again, they will be opposed to his message. You can't call sinners. They're hated. They're despised. You can't do that. Pride is a destructive power that keeps us from following Jesus. I want to illustrate this with a little scene from an episode in the, in the TV show, The Office, all right? Some of you laugh right away. Okay. Um, the third season of this series, Michael Scott, is, he's, uh, he's the regional manager of a paper company, and he's going to the corporate offices in New York to apply for a job. Corporate headquarters in New York City. And the interviewer, all right, present, or this interview, this is a, uh, kind of a funny picture of human pride. But the interviewer says, so let me ask you a question right off the bat. What do you think are your greatest strengths as a manager? And Michael says, Why don't I tell you about what my weaknesses are, my greatest weaknesses are? I work too hard, I care too much, and sometimes I can be too invested in my job. The interviewer, okay, and your strengths? Well, my weaknesses are actually my strengths. I guess it was funnier in the in the the show. All right. (laughs) Actually, my weaknesses are actually my strengths, right? He works too hard. He's, he cares too much. That's my weakness. And that, those are actually my strengths, all right? All right. He didn't get hired for the position. And sadly, many of us are just like him. We're unwilling to see our weaknesses, our failures, our sin, and our need for Jesus. We must be aware of the pride that makes us blind to our own sickness and our need for a Savior. Because if we pridefully, pridefully reject the message of the kingdom of God, we will ultimately oppose Jesus. The second way or the second choice we can make is we can humbly respond in faith, which would lead to us following Jesus. So Levi or Matthew, depending on you know, what, what name you want to call him here, he got up and followed Jesus. His response to Jesus' teaching was faithful obedience. Look at the four men last week who carried the paralytic. Right? They stepped out of the crowd. They had the faith. And when Jesus saw their faith, he healed the paralyzed man and he forgave him of his sins. In a few weeks, chapter 5, spoiler alert, there's going to be a woman who's bleeding for 12 years and she just thinks, if I just reach out and touch the edge of his cloak, I will be healed. And when she does, he looks at her and says, daughter, your faith has made you well. These are people who are realizing In humility, because that's the key here, is there's nothing that I can do on my own. All I can do and the only hope for me is to reach out and grab a hold of the only one who can do something for my situation. It's hearing about the message of the kingdom of God to say, I wholeheartedly need Jesus. He is the only one that can actually make me whole. We have to recognize that we have to live in a total dependence on God for every single thing in this world. So again, pride will reject the message of the kingdom of God. Humility will help us to respond in faith by realizing, okay, I can't do anything for my situation. According to this text, a tax collector and a sinner was despised, rejected, kicked out, and they said, you know what? According to the text, people were following him. Like sinners were following him because the message of grace reached them and grabbed a hold of them. 
So we look at those, how are we responding to the message of the kingdom of God? Have, are there areas in our life where we're pridefully rejecting the kingdom of God to take a hold of our lives, to, to, uh, for us to, to give our allegiance to the kingdom of God rather than to the kingdoms of this world? Or how are we continuing to practice humility? When Jesus says to follow me, you have to take up your cross and follow me daily. There's nothing like anyone who wants to follow me, they will deny themselves and pick up their cross and follow me. That's in the book of Luke. All right, he, that's that famous statement he makes there. But that means a daily submission and humility, humility to say, God, I can't do this on my own. I need to go after you. The third thing, I think, as we're taking this passage home, is this passage really shows us what it's like to imitate Jesus. Because if, if we're on mission, if we're following Jesus' mission in this world, then first of all, we have to see people through God's eyes. It gives us a lesson in imitating Jesus to see people through God's eyes. What's the most famous Bible verse of all time? Now we could probably debate on that, but we'll probably see it somewhere in the Super Bowl today on a, on a sign. Someone will hang it up, John 3, 16, right? It never says God so hated sinners that he sent his son. It, never, it says God so loved the world. Because God created the world and everything in it, God made a covenant with Abraham to, to make the world right again through the nation of Israel. And ultimately, Jesus represents Israel. So through his son, he's going to redeem creation and renew his covenant with his people. So God loves the world and is willing to call sinners out of their state of sinfulness and reconcile them back to himself. He doesn't say, change yourself, earn your way, and then I'll come to you. He comes to them and calls them in the midst of their sin. Romans chapter 5, an amazing passage, chapter 5, verse 6. Listen to these words that describe people as God calls them, as God works for their, on their behalf. For while we were still weak, you can circle that one. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. You can circle ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, circle that, Christ died for us. Since therefore we've now been justified by, by, his, blood, by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, circle that, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we are also rejoiced in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. God looked at people who were weak, or in the NIV it says powerless. I like that idea, powerless. Those who were ungodly, those who were enemies, those who were sinners. And it's in the midst of that state, Christ died for us. Demonstrates his love for the world. Right? God so loved the world, he demonstrates his love by dying for us. So what would it look like if we started seeing people through God's eyes? We like to take the sin and we like to, uh, to put that on the person and, and they get labeled because of the sin. And Jesus goes, these are sinners, I'm calling them, but I'm going to call them into a new kingdom. Like, they are deserving of my grace because I love them, because I love the world, and because I love people. Like, I'm going to call them into my kingdom. What if we saw the people of the world through God's eyes? Rather than, again, dehumanizing them because of their sin, but seeing them as someone who God wants to call into his kingdom. The second thing to imitate Jesus is we can invite outsiders to God's transforming kingdom. Because I believe that if we start to see them the way God sees them, then our hearts will be moved, we'll be compelled to invite people to come to God's transforming kingdom. John 20, verse 21, Jesus says he's about to leave his disciples after the resurrection. He says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. In the same way the Father has sent me, I am sending you. He's sending us to the sinners, to the outcast, to the enemies of God, to call them into this new kingdom. Behold, the kingdom of God is at hand. So as we co-mission with Jesus, we take his mission into the world. And a big part of that mission is inviting outsiders to God's kingdom party, right? His banquet, the banquet of transformation. So for anyone out there who feels despised, 
the transformation in God's kingdom is you will be respected. For those of you who feel disgraced, the kingdom invites you to a place of honor. For those of you who feel rejected, in the kingdom of God, you will be accepted. For those of you who are hated in this world, in the kingdom of God, you will be loved. For those of you who feel unqualified through the blood of Jesus in the kingdom of God, you are qualified. For those of you who feel unclean or defiled, you are invited to be cleansed in the kingdom of God. And if you feel alienated, God is doing everything he can to bring you near. And in fact, he takes up his residence within you and he promises to be with you always, even to the end of the age. Church, the grace of God is for the outcast. It's for the sinner. So let's invite them to the kingdom of God and watch God bring about a glorious transformation. Let's pray. God, we just thank you for this morning. God, we thank you for this, this story, Lord, where you show us exactly what you came to do. You came to call people who need a doctor. You called them to make them well. And Lord, help us to see, help us in, in our humility to see our need for you. Help us, Lord, to realize that we can do nothing apart from your grace and from your mercy and from your love, Lord. Help us to, to change our hearts to be totally and completely dependent on you for everything. And as we do, Lord, give us the courage and strength to see people through your eyes. And Lord, give us favor as we begin to invite those people who feel like outsiders, those people who feel like they're despised or disgraced and rejected and hated and unqualified and unclean and, and alienated from you, Lord. Give us favor as we invite people into your banquet so they can be transformed and given a new life in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.